This is Don Bettinelli, the CEO of SQPN, with a brief but very important message. For more than a decade, SQPN has produced the Catholic faith and pop culture podcast that you love. We're a nonprofit organization, so it's only your generosity that lets us carry out our mission. We haven't run a fundraiser in two years, and that's why we need to ask for your help right now. Please make a pledge of whatever amount you can afford to help us continue providing your favorite podcasts, as well as exciting new ones we have planned. To make your pledge and find out about the free thank you gifts we'd like to send you, visit sqpn.com slash give. That's sqpn.com slash give. Thank you for your generosity. May we hear from you today? You're listening to The Secrets of Star Trek, episode number 25. Captain DeBridge. Spock here. Make it so. Surrender is not an option. Attention crew of the Enterprise, this is James Kirk. We are all explorers, driven to know what's over the horizon, what's beyond our own shores. We would have helped you get home if you had asked. That's who Starfleet is. Hi, I'm Don Bettinelli, and you're listening to The Secrets of Star Trek, where we discuss the hidden layers and deeper meanings found in all the Star Trek TV series, movies, and more. And today we're discussing the first Star Trek Voyager episode, Caretaker. And joining me today on the panel are Jimmy Aiken. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. And Father Corey Stika. Hi, Father Corey. How's it going? So this is the first episode of, uh, this, of Star Trek Voyager. It aired uh, January 16th, 1995. It was a two-parter. Um, it uh, kind of falls into the... the, the uh, the pattern that we've seen of Star Trek uh, new series in the 90s, in the 90s uh, where there's a handoff from the previous series. Uh, you know, we, we've got, uh, you know, a, a character shows up from the previous one and, and there's some overflow into the into the new thing. Um, there's a lot of. Uh, there's there's a lot in this episode, there's a lot of um, behind the scenes drama that went into the making of this series hmm. um we had just finished the if long only they could have transitioned that on screen <laughs> well, know, right? that might have been part of the problem so we we had just finished the long run of uh star trek next generation it, it's transitioning to uh movies and um deep space nine is ongoing it's it, it's it's hit its stride at this point and we've got this new series and we, what do we do with it do we do just another Starship exploring like we did with the original series or next gen, or do we do something new? And so they decided we needed to do something new. We need to have, um, you know, they came up with the starship flung into the far reaches of the galaxy, far from home, making its way home. And and that wasn't unreasonable. You do need to do something to differentiate this mm -hmm. from next gen. Yeah. Because, I mean, next there had been such a gap between the original series and next gen that you could say, okay, guess what? We're going to explore the galaxy again on our new ship. And right. and and nobody would have said, oh, we've seen that premise before. Actually, a lot of people did say that, but, um, <laughs> yeah. but they got over it quickly. <laughs> um, so with Next Gen being such a fresh memory, and even then going on to do movies, you needed the spinoff series to do something different. And D right. DS9 did the obvious thing of let's use a space station instead of a spaceship. So if we're gonna, if we've already played the space station card, um, or are currently playing it, we need to do something with the ship. But how can we make it different? Let's do Lost in Space. That's reasonable, mm -hmm. right? And um, they amp up the drama as much as they can by throwing in this conflict between the Maquis, who are introduced in uh, Deep Space Nine, and Starfleet, and throwing these two crews together, which is supposed to create lots of conflict, but eventually doesn't. I mean, we kind of talked about all this in our overview of Voyager, yeah. so I don't want to spend too much time on that. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so in in this episode, we start with, like, opening text, you know, which yeah. I guess we also saw in uh, 
you know, at DS9. least briefly. DS9, you know, DS9, DS9 had it. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then we have a very Star Star Wars like opening with the big Cardassian ship versus the small small Maquis <laughs> ship. I noticed the same thing. <laughs> and and then we meet Tuvok the liar. It's like wow, yeah. this is the most lyingest Vulcan ever. Undercover exactly. Vulcan. <laughs> yeah. Who ever one thing I noticed is the the uh, the cabin of that uh, Maquis shuttle just happened to look exactly like the set for the DS Nine runabout. Yes, yeah. <laughs> a little redressed, yes. Um, one of the things that they mentioned was like, so due to the cost of building Voyager's Bridge and converting the old next-gen sets, uh, then they had to reshoot the scenes that they'd already shot with Genevieve Bujold that, for Janeway. Um, it was awful. Yes, and she, and she had to be replaced early on in production. Um, they had to bring in uh, um, uh, Kate Mulgrew, and they reshoot all that. Uh, it was th- great. But-, but but they had to reshoot her stuff again because um, she has her, you know, when she has her hair down, it's kind of fine. And it and it looked all weird uh, within the in all the various shots like you could see light through it. So that's why in she has dailies. Yes. And that's why they had to um, have reshoot it with her in this updo that she has early on um, <clears throat> that, that that bulbous. Bun that which I'm glad they got rid of eventually because yeah, it, it made her terrible. look really stern and <laughs> yeah, it wasn't an attractive look at all. Right. Um, and then they had very ambitious special effects scenes and in a substantial amount of location filming, this episode's final budget made it the most expensive television episode in Star Trek history. Uh, and when you adjust for inflation, still, <laughs> it's yeah. even more. Ex- and when you adjust for inflation, it's even more expensive than Wrath of Khan, which many people say was the best Star Trek movie. Um, right. So that's that's a pretty pretty substantial budget for this. Uh, so it's it's very interesting just to, to to talk about in this this sense of this. It's a what they essentially made was a movie uh, out of this pilot here, mm-hmm. and I just wish it'd come out <laughs> more movie like. So yeah. so what do we have? We have the Maquis. They get very much developed in Voyager, and we have. The, the the sense in this of uh, former Starfleet, sort of rebellious, they don't quite fit in. Some of them are mercenaries. Some are in it for uh, the for principle. Uh, you know, we we kind of get this. They, they're like uh, rebels and revolutionaries. Um, and we get mm-hmm. that early on in this. Um, we we can kind of divide this episode into two parts. We have the first part, with, which really involves the caretaker. Well, and then, and they kind of did divide it into two parts, each 45 minutes long. Right, exactly. Right. <laughs> and then we have a, a like a second uh, s- a screenplay story uh, involving the Ocampa, which still has the caretaker involved, but uh, we, we sort of very consciously shift from one to the other in this. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we have, you know, our various characters the uh, who are different early on, um, Chakotay, He's got his uh, indeterminate Western Hemisphere Native American background of some sort, um, which we get references to. It's very they're very conscious of his of presenting him as a Native American of some sort. Um, yeah, but what they're very unconscious of is the acceptability of having Tom Paris doing all these American Indian slurs at him in the 24th century. Exactly. Yeah, I, mean, I thought racism was a thing of the past. Come on, guys. <laughs> yeah. But was it at one point the wrong kind of Indian? I think it was Chakotay's wrong response. Yeah, was the, the yeah. idea that if I, if I save your life, you've got a life debt to me and that's wrong tribe. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, maybe, you know, maybe all that PC stuff is gone in the 24th century and we can we can take a joke about things maybe that it will see didn't didn't <laughs> feel like he was joking well because yeah. because uh what was it uh, apparently that the uh at the academy they teach uh racism against ferengi uh as we see with uh, mm. yeah. uh poor poor harry kim who's just a a babe in the woods uh when he gets to deep space nine and quark tries to cheat him and uh so, you that know, was the, a funny scene. Yes, that was, that was clever. Scene. That was pretty I, good. I find it very interesting that the character they chose, the token character of the old series, sending off the new series, is poor. Not star, anyone from Starfleet, nothing like that. Um, mm-hmm. Instead of, because with Deep Space Nine, it was very much, you know, very clearly for a reason, Picard handing off to uh, Cisco. It was very dramatic and tense. And this was very lighthearted and a uh, very different feel to it. So I thought that was an interesting difference. It may have had to do with actor availability. It may have also had to do with who, if if we're trying to introduce Harry Kim, because they're staging 
the actors as they introduce them and not giving them to right. us all at once. So we don't right. have information overload. So it's like, okay, we need a way to introduce Harry Kim. Do we have anything for him? Well, where would an ensign plausibly be at the beginning of this story? He'd right. be in a bar and that right. would make Quark yeah. logical. He's, you know, his first time out in the deep space, he's checking out the, the, the place and he, you know, first, the first time the, uh, the fresh out of the Academy sailor shows up in a port bar, someone's going to try to cheat him. That's just you know, yeah. the way it goes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it really is a reasonable way of doing it. And, and it's it, clever because by this time, by this time, Quark had been de had developed into a beloved character on DS9. Right. He was the breakout character. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 it also it gives us a character moment for Tom Paris, who <clears throat> is sort of a bad guy, but with a heart of gold and, you know, the, our mm -hmm. Starfleet people that we that we're supposed to, you know, really respect and idolize that, that Starfleet. They don't like Tom Paris. So there's automatically like. Are we not supposed to like this guy? Because right. I uh, don't think he does really have a heart of gold in this episode. I think he has a heart of normalness, but well, he also saves this bad boy <laughs> overlay. He does save Harry from being cheated and sort of befriends him uh, a little bit, you know. Yeah. So there's a little, you know, the Harry's got the lost puppy thing that uh, that he got. So let's talk about Tom first. We 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 had mentioned in the overview that Tom Paris um, was not supposed to be. The character it was supposed to be mm -hmm. um was it Nick Locarno from the next generation episode the first duty and he was the right. uh, the washed out of the academy and we we're supposed to understand that he went to go with the maquis and for yeah, whatever I was like, why why did they change that that would have been great yeah for whatever reason I think they wanted to maybe shed the baggage or add that uh, Nick's um dad was an admiral or something I don't know it was very interesting that they that they made the change. It probably says some something somewhere out there on the on the net that mm. explains it. And if anyone knows it, we we'd welcome the feedback at Trek at my guess would com. my guess would be they wanted to give him the admiral dad, and they couldn't have plausibly said, "Oh, and by the way, Nick Lacarno's dad was an admiral who we never saw in that episode." Right. Like if his dad was an admiral, he would have showed up <laughs> at the hearings mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. Um, I do I do notice that the uh, enlightened future version of incarceration still includes being transported to the Antipodes, uh, <laughs> sent to a penal colony but, in New Zealand. But not for life. But not for life, right. <laughs> and probably a lot more comfortable than it was when Australia was a penal colony. Yeah, I'm going to guess that. Um, uh, we have it. So he's recruited to betray his old colleagues by guiding the Voyager to, through the Badlands to where they're at. Although he doesn't do a whole lot of guiding, uh, by the way, once they get there. Yeah. Um, he's just sort of standing there, uh, at, you know, not doing much while they get hammered by this displacement wave. Um, there is, and, and at that point, we get to meet the doctor now that the physical doctor ends right. up dying. The, Ooh, very by many the way, of the was crew. very unpleasant. That, that yeah. the, the original doctor was very unpleasant. Yeah, it did mm -hmm. not, he was not likable. In fact, much of the crew that gets killed in that first episode, the first officer, the helmsman, they were all kind of, well, no, no great loss. I mean, none of them were yeah. all that likable, which is what you'd want to do from a certain point. Either we don't want to know these people at all, or we certainly don't want the audience becoming attached to them if we're about to kill them off. Right. Exactly. Um, yeah. I love the doctor's initial lines. Um, when he shows up, please state the nature of the medical emergency. Great line. Also, tricorder and then someone hands him a tricorder medical tricorder <laughs> right. yeah <laughs> right where's where's the nurse where's the like you know, well that's the funny thing is like when you an emergency medical hologram is activated it's probably because the re regular medical staff is not available so for him right. to be uh to, to yeah. not realize that yeah um well it could be i mean he could assume the doctor is unavailable but uh, the nurses might be more plentiful right that's that's possible i suppose and by the by the I, by the way, I, I don't know if I mentioned I may have mentioned this in our overview of this, but last year or earlier this year, I was um, at a social occasion where someone um, went into cardiac arrest, mm. and mm. the everybody who was there instantly just snapped into place and started doing things to save this guy's life, and we did. Um, and it was my job to talk to 911 and other mm. people were like giving CPR while 
uh, and I was also I ran and got the uh, defibrillator that was at the facility and so forth. And they have these amazing. It was kind of like an EMH. We had um, the defibrillators they have now will talk you through the CPR process. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They'll you know they put the they instruct you on how to place the pads for an EKG. They tell you to get clear. They'll tell you it'll start the shocking procedure. It'll say now give breath, and it'll yeah. to tell you when to breathe into the person's lungs. And so that was kind of an interesting experience. But what I found dis and very dramatic experience. What I found disheartening though was talking to nine one one, because I, I assumed you know I dial nine one one and I assume I'm going to get the equivalent of please state the nature of the emergency, right? Right. And I didn't. And it's like, come on, fiction is more. Let's get things moving than this is. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so I thought that real life 911 could take a tip from Voyager. And that's probably the <laughs> nicest thing I'll ever say about Voyager. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's th- talk about some of the other aspects of, uh, of, of this episode. Um, one, I felt it was very odd to see Voyager as it was supposed to be, you know, whole, um, you know, still in the alpha quadrant, you know, with, the the, 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 uh, the dining room being with, with the, is no kitchen in the dining room. People right. doing the jobs that they're supposed to be doing. Um, it, it's not makeshift at all. It was. I thought it was a very interesting experience to kind of to see that again. It, you know, given yeah, the, the, the contrast of what they developed the ship and the crew into versus what it was originally. Right. And um, I, I found Janeway to be very stiff. I mean, she's a, she's kind of stiff mm-hmm. throughout the series, but very stiff uh, in the beginning. Um, but perhaps that's because Kate Mulgrew was a late addition to the cast. Well, and there's and always the, been that there's always been that aspect of the, you know, just as, um, you know, we talk about uh, with Doctor Who at, at a regeneration, um, mm-hmm. you know, where they're growing into their character. Well, there's always been that aspect in Star Trek. Look at, you know, look at Picard at the beginning of Next Gen. He was a jerk. Yeah. He was not liked, and but he, but again, he became one of the more beloved characters of that series. Although he uh, never got unstiff, no, well, no he just became yeah. more beloved. And, <laughs> and a- a- Avery Avery Brooks in yep. DS Nine, he was always very stiff too. I mean, except in, in it, with his underlings, not right, with right. his son or his girlfriend, but with his underlings, he was always strict. Right, and mm-hmm. and actually, well. He loosened up. I mean, there were times when it was Jedzia and Jedzio, others. yeah, yeah. So, so there was a there, we were supposed to get some humanizing moments with Janeway and her boyfriend and their dog and that sort of stuff, but um, it felt a little stiff. And in fact, um, that whole scene where Harry's like, you know, calls her sir, and then she says, uh, you know, I know others captains are okay with sir, but don't call me sir. Says ma'am, and then she says, well. Um, it's okay, uh, you know, and he says, yes, Captain. Well, that it's crunch time. And then she's like, it's not crunch time yet. It's like, you know, there is protocol. You know, this is, it's yeah. not just your preference, lady. It's, this is how things are done exactly. to help things run properly. And <clears throat> so you have yes and sir, because you, because you, not just yes, but yes, sir, because it conveys, I understand and I will carry it out. Not, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, by the court, you you served in the military. You understand a little bit of that. Well, you know, and I mean, immediately in the Air Force, uh, we would do sir or ma'am. Right. You know, um, at least for officers. Now, like if I'm talking to another enlisted, I might, you know, say airman so-and-so or sergeant so-and-so. Right. Uh, but for officers, it was always yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. You but know, not just uh, yes. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You know, it was... Um, and I mean, it, it really depended to, yeah, it, it more familiar, it would, you would say like, yes, captain or yes, you know, lieutenant or whatever, you right. know, but uh, to to have it dressed down like that, I, I most officers wouldn't do that. Yeah, I, I think that's really just because they previously established in Star Trek that by the 23rd century, you had cap you had female officers being called sir like mr mm-hmm. savik right and and they w- didn't want to put janeway in that role they wanted her to be able to be more feminine and be okay with ma'am which would sound more natural to the ears of the ongoing audience right mm-hmm. and so that i think the, the that was just an excuse 
to get the ma'am sir issue resolved for the sake of the audience. Right. Good. So <clears throat> we have this this uh the premise is that uh this caretaker being is looking for a mate to to create a, a progeny that will continue its mission to care and watch over uh watch over the Okapa. Uh -huh. I've got to think there's a better way to date than randomly seizing <laughs> ships from across the galaxy and hoping one of them is is your mate. Delta Quadrant um, Tinder. Yeah, I was like, yeah. come on, can't, can't isn't there Swipe an app left. you guys can use? Swipe left. <laughs> <laughs> no kidding. That's a, no, that's some random dating. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, the the Maquis end up over there, and then the the Voyager ends up over there. And they end up in this illusion, this weird illusion, which I, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure what the point was. Is why doesn't the caretaker just transport them over there in their like unconscious state and test them? Like, what was the point of this illusion? Yeah, I, I know, and it's 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 also plays into. I, I mean, you have this disorienting environment where it's like maybe 19th century America and we're on a farm and people are playing banjos and starting to dance. And it's, and you know, this is, this is meant to be creepy. And it's like, guys, this is going to turn deliverance on us. This is a <laughs> yeah. standard anti-Southern right. American Hollywood trope where right. the Southerners end up getting portrayed as menacing in some way. Right. The pitchforks yeah. come out. Literally. Yeah. <laughs> Literally. Literally. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It was so it was so weird. And then um but when the when the caretaker is eventually confronted uh with, you know, the kidnapping of people and dragging them away from their part of the galaxy, he says it was necessary. And it's interesting that the the caretaker's ethics are essentially this this alien being is situational. It's very much subjective. Right. I I I need it. It's utilitarian. I need I needed you. I used you and I'm discarding you. And it's very exactly. interesting. Yeah, except he's got this weird other than his mating prime directive. He's he's also got this I did something to the Ocampans in the past and therefore I owe them big time that trumps anything I might do to anybody else. Yeah, well right. you did something bad to us. <laughs> like yeah. Send us back. yeah. Exactly. <laughs> oh, but but you're not part of a whole planet. You're just a little starship. Right, right. Yeah. You know. By the way, speaking of the Ocampans, um, I, I had in my notes, you know, once Janeway starts interacting with them, it's like, wait, we're really at Jim Kirk levels of prime directive violation right now. I mean, yeah. shouldn't you be calling an ethics committee to talk about how you're interacting with this culture? <laughs> yeah, I think uh, Next Gen I mean, uh, Voyager throws out uh, the prime directive early on, doesn't it? Um, in it fact, throws it out, but it does come up. Every well, in once fact, while Jamie gets throw it out there. She, she does get confronted. To their credit, they do confront her with her violations of the Prime Directive later on in uh, seasons. Um, I find the, it's interesting. The, the original Okampa were much more telepathic than Kess ever was. I mean, mm -hmm. she we, she eventually becomes a, a telepathic super being later on for some reason. But and and she does just demonstrate some telepathic abilities at times. But in this episode. Telepathy appears to be a primary means of communication among them, right? Uh, which is interesting. Uh, so, so that so that was a little different. Um, we have uh, Janeway and Tuvok they, uh, discussing the Okampa planet. They 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 say it's an M class with an atmosphere, but it has no moisture at all and no nucleogenic particles in the atmosphere, which means no rain. And I'm like, which that's nonsense. nucleogenesis is a real yeah. thing has nothing to do with the atmosphere. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a nuclear reaction. It's particles and, that produce from a nuclear reaction, such as a nuclear bomb or inside of a star. Or, yeah. well, in, or in, in the earthbound case, it's the natural decay of a uranium in the ground, you know, mm -hmm. it's natural radiation. Right. It, it has nothing to do well, with rainfall. But that's, that's what causes rain, don't you know? Yeah. Apparently. Uh, also, well, the idea of no moisture is clearly hyperbole. There couldn't be a biosphere if there was no moisture. Well, and in fact, like, not just on this planet, but it, like, this supposedly there's no water. It, anywhere within range of the Kazon or Neelix's vessel? Like, this, is, yeah. this, this is this is ridiculous because it's like V, where the aliens wanted water or something. Right. Um, it, 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 because 
hydrogen and oxygen are two of the most common elements in the universe. <laughs> right. All you got to do is bring them together. <laughs> no, I mean, there, there are no comets that are ice balls. There are no well, nothing, well, yeah. nothing that can produce water. Nothing. Well, it's like, you know, Ooh, what is this technology you have to produce water? It's called, it's, it's called, I mean, we have it in the 20th century. You have spaceships that can travel between planets. Like, how can you not be able to make water? Yeah, yeah. It, it doesn't make sense. I mean, because frank, frankly, how could you survive without w water at the level that they that they demonstrate? I mean, yes, we have civilizations on Earth who live in uh, desert-like areas that, that mm -hmm. have to harvest water from unusual sources. But usually they are small uh, civilizations with, with with very, yeah. you know, very little technology. They, they don't have spaceships. Right. It's uh, it's very uh, um, yeah. it's it, it, it's hard to buy. And, yeah. and that was unfortunate. One of the first things you do as you start to develop technology is figure out how to get reliable sources of water, even if it means moving. Well, well in fact, water yeah. is a byproduct of early rocketry. Uh, you know, rockets, uh, when they combine the hydrogen and the oxygen in the uh, in our in our rocket engines, it actually produces water vapor. Uh, mm -hmm. So, yeah. Uh, one of the things I noticed with this watching this now is how much the caretaker story is like the story of uh, Ego in Guardians of the Galaxy 2. Did either of you see that uh, movie? Oh, sure. Uh, yeah. So in that one, Kurt Russell is this planet uh, creature who is searching for uh, a mate to, to produce progeny uh, and discarding those that are unworthy or that mm -hmm. don't measure up. Uh, or aren't fitting. Yeah. Uh, so it's, uh, I thought it was going to be, that, but the guy, it felt like maybe uh, James Gunn was lifting a little bit from uh, a Voyager. Uh, so I thought that was interesting. Um, Kess comes off as a more interesting character here, mm -hmm. uh, in my view, than she does in the rest of Voyager in yeah. many ways. Uh, I think she only goes downhill. A bit more, sure. bit more sy sympathetic here. And I think that was part of the problem that eventually led her to uh, be replaced by the uh, eye candy. I mean, 709. <laughs> yeah. Well, if 7 was stronger than Kess ever proved to be, Kess became very much like the wide-eyed innocent, whereas she mm -hmm. wasn't as much of in this episode. Yeah, and that's part of the issue. I mean, the essence of drama is character conflict, and Kess just had no character conflict. Yeah. You know, she 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 I mean, she had little flashes of it at times. Um, but she was apparently saving it all up for becoming an angry super being that wanted to kill everybody. Yeah, in an right. episode that made no sense, and we'll talk about that someday when we get to it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but in this episode, she's actually almost like Neelix's uh, conscience because Neelix yeah. is much more morally, uh, you know, m uh, much less of who he eventually becomes. I mean, he's a, he's a little more willing to do things and betray and underhanded he, sly. He, he's the slimy wheeler dealer character. Yeah, he a lot less of that in the future. Um, mm -hmm. By the end of the episode, he, we've they've kind of settled into their new roles, um, right. and then we have the introduction of one of my least favorite of all villains in uh, Star Trek, the Kazon, the the, oh, bad, the wild haircut, the bad With hair the, uh, people. The, yeah, the racial bad hair day. It amazing. Um, so I was unclear on why do the Kazon want to attack the caretaker. Did either one of y'all have a good handle on that? They they wanted the technology, maybe. That's that's the only thing I could think of was it was to get the power from his, the technology that he had in his his space station to okay. be able to the array to be able to conquer more, conquer well, other people any, or whatever. Yeah, I think they're kind of punching above their class. I mean, for something that can whisk starships 70,000 light years in a second, mm -hmm. all he has to do is give your ship a little push and you're never going to see home again. Well, I think yeah. they, they know at this point that the that the caretaker is done. It was like it's like the house is empty, um which is mm. why they're attacking since he's no longer you know sending those energy blasts to the Ocampa. Um Right. But the the thing that happens here at the end of this episode is some is Sort of the, uh, like uh, another thing that didn't get thought through that undermines the entire premise of the series, which is Janeway uh, oh, as, yeah. as in principle, we we have to sacrifice our ability to get home to keep for the, the Ocampa, right? To keep the technology out of the hands of the Kazon, protect the Ocampa. So we're going to destroy <laughs> the array. Like, hey, I have an idea. 
let's set a timed bomb. That's what I was saying. That goes off yeah. just after we use well, the technology to send us back home. To be fair, to be fair, they did say that when the Kazon ship crashed into the array, it, it destroyed or damaged the self-destruct stuff. Okay, let's let's lose that conceit that in this entire array, there's only one spot where the entire self-destruct mechanism exists. Okay, we'll use that conceit. Right. They couldn't have set some kind of timer on their little photon torpedo right. thingy so that they would have sat there and circled for like five minutes and then boom. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's what I'm th- saying. This is like, it's... it, it the, the, you could come up with a trek, you know, a plausible technology explanation. I know it undermines the very premise of the series, which yeah. is that they're stuck in this. But it, what it shows to me well, is, is that they didn't think it out. They 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 said, "Well, it's good enough." You know, there's a hole yeah. there, but let's just move on. It, it, I think it's even worse than that because not only is there that problem, but you have this all this build up to Janeway's dramatic moral choice: do we stay or do we go? And mm-hmm. we stay. To protect the Okampa. And then what happens immediately after? Oh, let's just abandon the Okampa and start heading home. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> Leave them to their Kazon friends. Well, I mean, yeah, I guess they assume that the Okampa are safe underground. Uh, now that for the, five uh, years. Uh, except for the little holes that are everywhere. Right, for five years. I don't know what they're yeah. going to do in five years. Uh, hopefully they figure out how to take care of themselves in that time. Um, so, you know, as she says to the Oka- to the caretaker about the Okampa, it's the challenge of surviving on their own that helps them to evolve, uh, which actually, in a way, is her about the, the Voyager crew. This is what they're going to mm-hmm. do, is they're going to have to survive on their own to and evolve to make it home. And that's what happens in Voyager. So it's a bit, you know, it's a bit of a, um, a self, uh, you know, a, a, I'm trying to say, it's, it's a, the writer inserting a bit in there that's, that has two meanings. Uh, to it for for our consumption. One of the things that uh, that also kind of came up for me was Chakotay defers to Janeway in everything, in, like, really right fast. off the bat. Like, yeah, he, yeah, he is a rebel. He has abandoned his his standing in Starfleet to become a, a Maquis rebel, and she was hunting him down. And suddenly, now she makes all the decisions, and he just goes along with it. Exactly. Yeah. There, there are a number of additional logic problems like that. Um, <clears throat> the caretaker and his mate are explorers from another galaxy, so you only sent two of them, and they don't have an effective way to communicate. No, no, no. no. The, he said two of us were left behind, so there was okay. more of them, and they okay. were left there. But still, you, you your species you have left two phone? people away. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, also, Balana is like telling. Uh, so, with Voyager and the Maquis ship talking about the Kazon ship, Balana at one point says, "Neither of us has enough firepower to stop that ship." And so that's the pretext for getting the Maquis ship destroyed. Right. But then it doesn't seem like Voyager does has a big problem here, because. Because it doesn't have a uh, ability to defend itself against the Kazon. Yeah, or I mean, it, and it, so yeah, yeah that's, yeah, that's I mean, yeah, if one ship, one ship. Of course, they kind of backtrack that too because it went from oh, we don't have enough firepower to deal with this one big ship to all of a sudden Voyager was the most powerful ship in the gal in that part of the galaxy, and and well, and no, you know, late in later can, episodes, well, no, yeah. No, they they do they they don't actually abandon that point. It comes up in the first season whenever like when they encounter the Kazon, um, that they that there are different sized Kazon ships, and some of the Kazon ships are big enough that they do represent a major threat to Voyager. Hmm. Uh, so, <clears throat> I think what they're saying here is is you know the regular firepower isn't enough, so they ram the big Kazon ship with uh, the Maquis vessel, which then you know, causes it to crash into the caretaker array mm-hmm. uh, and puts it out of commission. So now they just have the small keys on ships to deal with. And that lets uh, Voyager escape at this point. Um, but yeah, I, I don't, I don't see that as a, as a, as a big hole in this, in, in the logic, just because hmm. we do see them have to deal with the, the keys on in that, from that okay. point view, which is actually not a bad thing that they aren't the most powerful anyway. Mm-hmm. No, you wouldn't want them to be. Yeah. Um, one, another, just this is just a minor thing, but <clears throat> you know how if you've ever seen the movie Forbidden Planet, 
uh, there where there's an ancient dead race called the Krell. And Walter Pigeon explains, as a human scientist, he explains that um, no record of their physical form has survived, which is ridiculous. But you can get an idea of what they looked like based on the shapes of their doors. And he points to their one of their doors, and it's like almost a pentagon, or, you <laughs> right. know? And, and so you can imagine someone fitting through that the way our bodies fit through our rectangular doors. Well, okay, so when we finally see the caretaker without the corn pone turned sinister illusion, yeah. um, it's a big blob. Yep. And it's in this incredibly angular ship. I mean, what's going on with the blob <laughs> designers? I know. I mean, did the, 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 there, were, there were actual like beds and things. Did it, did it have to create those yeah. <laughs> in the thousands of years? Yeah, that was, um, yeah, it didn't seem quite to fit. And apparently they take the caretaker's body with them. Uh, because as we see later on, um, it begins to vibrate in the presence of another of the same species. Mm, yeah. As they do. Uh, so, in general, it's like a lot of the other first episodes of the series for Star Trek, uh, a bit of an uneven beginning. Um, so, so far, the best. Um, well, of the '90s era Star Treks, '80s and '90s Star Treks, I think Deep Space Nine has the best of the beginnings we've seen so far. Yeah, mm -hmm. yes, uh, I would agree with. That. Um, I thought you were going to say this is the best of the Voyager episodes we've watched so far. <laughs> well, that's true by definition. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there uh, are some better ones. Yes, yeah. yes. Yes, uh, I, 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 I am. Uh, I am more sanguine about uh, Voyager than than Jimmy is, and, but mm -hmm. but we did get. I did notice. Several instances of some kind of. Uh, oh yeah, and we did expend a number of photon torpedoes. So that uh, so let's start the count now uh, of uh, the number of photon torpedoes that Voyager is carrying. Do I recall in this one they said we only have six, and then they used all six, or am I thinking of some another the, scene in Star the Trek? The Maquis vessel had only six. Oh, okay, okay, yep. But the, I think at some point they. I don't know if it was this one or or a. a one oh no! It's up. from the it, it's from the Deep Space Nine uh, premiere. Yes, where, oh, right. Uh, yes, yes, yeah. yes. That's right. That they only had six. So, uh, so <clears throat> I guess that's it on Voyage on uh, on uh, Caretaker uh, for us. Um, w I'll throw it out to the audience. What did, did you have? Anything particularly that you loved about it? Uh, other things that we might have missed? The uh, plot points or behind the scenes clues to. Um, why the why it showed up the way it is? Why was Tom Paris replacing Nick Locarno, for instance? Uh, we'd love to hear from you. So uh, send us a, a message. Go to sqpn.com uh, slash trek or the uh, SQPN Facebook page and leave us a comment on the show's episode there. Uh, you can leave us feedback there or send us an email to trek at sqpn.com. Uh, you can find links relevant to our discussion on our show notes at sqpn.com. Um, and please, if you could uh, like, share, uh, retweet, uh, and get just get the news out about our podcast, Secrets of Star Trek. Uh, there are lots of Star Trek fans out there. Um, and there are other Star Trek podcasts, but we think ours is unique. So we have a unique voice, something you need to share. If you're enjoying this, chances are your other Star Trek fans will too. So please share the, the podcast with them. And uh, we, you can subscribe, iTunes, TuneIn, Stitcher, Google Play, and even on YouTube uh, at the SQPN YouTube channel. Uh, so we'll be back next time when we'll be discussing Star Trek Enterprise's first episode, uh, Broken Bow. And until then, Father Corey Stika, thank you for joining me and sharing the secrets of Star Trek. Yeah, thank you, Dom. Jimmy Aiken, thank you as well. We'll live long and prosper. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to The Secrets of Star Trek on StarQuest. This is Dom Bettinelli again. We hope you've enjoyed this podcast and that you'll help us keep producing the podcasts you love. Thank you for your generosity. To make your pledge and find out about the free thank you gifts we'd like to send you, visit sqpn.com give. That's sqpn.com slash give.